Hello, my name is Will. Welcome to Cornerstone Church Bristol online service. We're so glad that you're with us. We are a church who seek to make Christ known in Bristol, Britain and beyond. Um, and it's good to be worshipping with you today. We're going to be hearing from Mike, who's going to give our talk today, and Laura's going to read for us. We'll also hear from Bob, one of our long-standing members, about how he's been getting on during lockdown period. But first, we're going to hear from Dylan, who will be leading us in worship. Let me pray. Father God, please be with us today. Show us more about you and help us to worship you in our daily lives as we come out of this week. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we come before you this morning, may you give us hearts to worship you. Um, may you be able to worship you fully, God, without anything distracting us. Um, help us just to love you, because you're worthy of our praise. May this time be useful for building up um, this church. We ask in precious name. darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Yeah. 
This morning I'm with someone who has been a member of the Cornerstone Church family for over 10 years. He's affectionately known by multiple names, Robert, Rob, Bob, Uncle Bob, and by a select uh, few Bobbles. I'm going to ask you this morning, Rob, uh, it's 10 years now, what has that 10 years meant to you? Uh, to me, particularly, it's meant uh, community. Um, when you talk about the Cornerstone family, that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. This is my family. Um, and it's developed over that period of time. Uh, I remember right back in, when we were developing the website in the first place, um, Tom Elliott uh, asking me for one word that kind of encapsulated Cornerstone. Um, and that was belong. That sprung to mind straight away, you know. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do over the years is to belong mm -hmm. to this church community. Um, and it's been extremely rewarding, you know. I retired early and I didn't have a plan for after retirement. And mm -hmm. Cornerstone came along just at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I was able to put my energies into um, doing what I saw was necessary as far as the cornerstone of the church was concerned. And uh, that's been great, you know, that's developed over the years. Um, and we, we now have a, a thriving church, not at this moment in time, obviously mm -hmm. not, but um, it's, it's lovely to have such a young element as part of the church, yeah, you know, yeah. that, that's what really makes me tick. Mm -hmm. um, hence all the various names that I've got, you know, because uh, I love nothing better than being in a position to help younger people mm -hmm. um, as they go through life, they go to uni, they find all the problems that are going to beset them there, um, which are all life problems, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think as a church we, we recognise that young people do have life problems and we're here to help them mm -hmm. to resolve that, you know, and when I sort of check and pass, I've probably lived and done and been most of the problems that they encounter, so it's never a problem to um, to be of some assistance to them, you know, and, and that to me is such a blessing, you know. Um, I could say, you know, I prefer young people to people my own age, you know, but that kind of puts you in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, but we can still be young. <laughs> very much so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, no, it's a real blessing. Uh, I think, you know, and if anybody does really join this church uh, in the sense of really becoming part of it, mm -hmm. terrific blessing, mm -hmm. real, real blessing. Yeah. I'd wish that for anybody that wants to come along. Get yourself immersed in church life and what goes on and what needs to help in and what needs to do. Uh, and it's a terrific, you get a terrific payback, mm -hmm. let's say, for any effort or energy you put in. Um, it comes back twofold, threefold. Mm -hmm. Behind all this, uh, Rob, you've uh, got underlying health problems, as they say in modern language, uh, in these days of COVID. How have you coped? Um, remarkably well, to be honest with you. Um, in the early days, when we were all frantically phoning in supermarkets to try and get food in, I suddenly remembered that I, I had an involvement in a company called Wiltshire Farm Food mm -hmm. Advertising. And uh, that saw me over the first month or so. Mm -hmm. I just phoned up, ordered food, it came the next day, and that was brilliant. Um, but as time went on, uh, my wife Jeanette, she started going to the supermarket and, and, uh, because she was in a shelter like I was. Mm -hmm. um, so she she took up that role uh, of buying the food there and what have you, you know. And we spent most days with each other, doing jigsaws to be honest with you, um, which was good fun. 
Uh, and it was good to get on it. Uh, nice to have somebody. Um, and we both said the same. Don't know what we would have done without each other in that period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, which has been uh, a real blessing, to be honest. And as far as health is concerned, you know, I, I, f I feel blessed that the various complaints that I've got, I can deal with relatively easily. Um, they're there for life, but that's fine. It doesn't really matter. I can, mm -hmm. I can get by with them anyway, you know, mm -hmm. put them in any detail. But um, you just learn. You learn mm -hmm. to cope. You learn to live with things, you know. And, and uh, basically, that's what I've done, mm -hmm. you know. Great. And question that I'm asking everyone. Hopefully, one day we'll be free of the virus, or yeah, as free as we can be. <laughs> what are you looking forward to? Uh, sitting down in Costa, having a coffee with a friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. Yeah. I mean, prior to that was largely my sort of daily life mm -hmm. was meeting somebody in a cafe somewhere, having a drink, having a chat, exchanging stories. How's life? Uh, what do we need? What do you need? What can I help you with? That that's my life. That's what I do, yeah. you know. And, and um, that's been a big miss. Mm -hmm. I have to say, you know, the, the inability to, you know, I know I, it's like anything else, you get a text for somebody and you read into it, mm, that person's not too clever. Now, in, in the past, I would have made a point of seeing that person, having a coffee with them, having a chat mm -hmm. with life, you know, what, what's the problem? It's not available, mm -hmm. couldn't, couldn't they do it, you know? And, and that's a real shame to me, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think that's a real, but there we are, you know, we're gradually, uh, finding ways to get in touch with people and spend some bit of time with them and mm -hmm. you know like your back garden for instance mm -hmm. um, and that's great you know that the people because in this period I guess it's easy to feel that you're out of touch mm -hmm. you know you're, you're no you're not having fellowship with anybody you know uh, because it's uh, you know especially if people are, are sort of sheltered um, that's been really difficult you mm -hmm. know and, and uh, I mean, let's just hope that, you know, as you say, this, there is an end to this at some stage, whenever that may be. Uh, and we can get back to a semblance of normality, because it'll be a different normality mm -hmm. thereafter, you know. But we're adaptable, you know, we, mm -hmm. can, we can change and, you know, um, through global gifts of strength to do whatever it is we need to do. And yeah. That's good enough for me, you know. Well, Uncle Bob, thank you. It's been good to talk to you. You did forget to add causing mischief in the cafe. Oh yes, well, but, uh, only only occasionally. Yeah. Is that he's gone back to an occasion where we were sitting drinking coffee, and I was trying to expand on something, and I knocked the coffee over on the table. It went over his birthday jacket, and over the table, and all over the floor, and. Uh, the staff just came out and, and cleared everything up and gave us new drinks and that was it, you know. But we looked around and the place was full of really old people who were splitting their sides at the antics of two years, you know. <laughs> Poor old, old fools, you know. As Mike said, if we'd been 18 and done that, we'd have got thrown out. <laughs> well, there you are. Anyway, thank you, Rob. It's been good to talk to you this morning. Yeah, and you, Mike.
reading comes from Exodus 3 verses 1 to 15. One day Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses! Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress. Because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of, is, of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go, the people of Israel, and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. 
This morning we're going to look at how Moses became the greatest leader of all time. When we look at the preceding chapters, we find that Moses was brought up as an Egyptian prince, though he was from Israel. In defending Israel, Moses messed up big time, had to leave, and now we find him a shepherd out in the wilderness tending sheep, which he'd done for 40 years. He's walking through the wilderness and suddenly he sees a bush on fire. This may not have been unusual to him. It may, he may well have many times seen bushes with spontaneous combustion. It was very hot out in the, in the desert and the wilderness. But there's something special about this bush. Despite the fire, it didn't burn. And so Moses himself looked at it and thought, I must investigate. The verse says, I would turn aside and see this great sight. See why the bush doesn't burn. The NIV uh, says that he went to investigate. And as he approached the bush, a voice came out of it calling Moses, Moses. God was in the midst of that fire. And it's interesting that God called him by name. God knows our name. We see it in another example later on with Samuel. Samuel, little boy, lying in his bed and the voice of God calls Samuel, Samuel. God has a personal relationship with us. He knows us. He knows our name. And he knows us when he wants to call us. He knows our personality. He knows about us. And he will call us by name. Moses approached the bush and God said, Don't draw near. Take your sandals off. You're now on holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look on God. And here we have an example of God introducing himself. And then God explains why he, he is there. And in verse 7 he said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry and I know their sorrows. Again the NIV says, I'm concerned for their suffering. So I have come down. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up to a new land, a land which is flowing with milk and honey. And so, so we see a sequence here. He saw, he heard, he understood, and then he took action. He heard the cry of his people crying out in their suffering. And recently I saw a video clip from Romania, from the village of Udest near Sachava, a place that I, I know well. And the video showed people on the sides of the street, on their knees, praying. The whole village turned out. They'd had so many losses from COVID-19 that as a whole village they were crying out to God for his mercy. Oh, if we did that as a land, or the world did that. God hears those prayers. He hears that cry. If only we cry out to him. He will hear. He will understand. He will take action. And so he says 
in verse 10, Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people out of Israel, uh, uh, children of Israel out of Egypt. God was calling Moses to go back to where he had failed 40 years before by taking the law into his own hands. And there are times in life when we have to run away or run away from facing a situation or we mess up. And there are times when we have to return, face that situation again and deal with it. And that's what God was asking Moses to do. But this brought on a kind of identity crisis, which often happens when um, we're told to do something or asked to do something. We say, who me? And Moses said, who am I that I should go to see Pharaoh? Who am I that I should bring Israel out of Egypt? It was kind of identity crisis that Moses was going through. But God said, I'll be with you. And you will have signs. And Moses said to God, when I come to the children of Israel, the God of fathers has sent me. And they say to me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? You see, the children of Israel, during the years that they were in Egypt, had kind of lost sight of God. We've evidence of that when they are released and God has to bring the commandments. So he has to teach them. He has to describe to them who he is and what he means. But Moses was in fact saying, what, what's my authority? And God came back with an answer which always puzzled me as a child. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell them, I am has sent me. It didn't seem to make sense to me very much as a child, but now I see it. And now I can know God better. I realise that he was saying, I will what I will be. God is God over all. He's the creator. He can be who he likes. He can have whatever name he likes. He doesn't have to be, have a separate identity. He is the very being of this world. And God said to Moses, this is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. And now we're going to read and continue the story with our second reading in chapter 4, verses 1 to 23. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and turned back and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak and when he took it out again, his hand was as white as snow with severe with a severe skin disease now put your hand back into your cloak the lord says so moses put his hand back in and when he took it out again it was healthy as the rest of his body the lord said to moses if they do not believe you and you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign they will be convinced by the second sign and if they don't believe you or listen to you even after these two signs then take some water from the nile river and pour it on the dry ground when you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not very good with words. I never have been, and I am not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Then the Lord asked Moses, 
Well, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, it will be with you, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother Aaron and Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he is on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be both with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say, and your shepherd's staff with, and take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. But before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, Return to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you have died. So Mo Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand he carried the staff of God. And the Lord told Moses, When you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, so I command you, let my son go so he can worship me. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. This is where the what-if factor begins. Moses answered and said, suppose they won't believe me, or even listen to my voice. Suppose they say, well, the Lord didn't really appear to you. The Lord changed his tack. He said to Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses replied, a rod. God says, throw it on the ground. The rod is the only tool that the shepherd carries both for controlling his sheep and also for defence. It's a weapon. And God's asking him to throw it down. And there are times when we have to throw our defence down. We have to go empty-handed. I remember uh, going through the Romanian border on one of my early trips. I passed into no man's land. The Hungarian border guard took my um, passport and papers and just threw it on a desk in a hut, along with many others. And we sat for some hours waiting for something to happen. I had no way forward and no way back, because I couldn't pass through either borders without my passport. And I felt very vulnerable. In fact, I felt frightened. The one thing that would take me through was sitting on a table, doing nothing. And Moses threw away his rod. He put it on the ground. And then the Lord said, pick it up. And so Moses picked it up and it became a serpent. What a strange thing to happen. A serpent on the ground, a dangerous thing, a frightening thing. But the Lord says, take it by the tail, pick it up. And as Moses had the faith to take that snake by the tail and pick it up, it turned back into a rod. When miracles happen, sometimes we we feel that they don't really convince us. Sometimes they boost our faith. I remember once at church someone praying, Lord, give us miracles that we might have faith. It doesn't always work that way. 
It's more often it's our faith that brings around miracles. And so God had to take a second step. He said to Moses, put your hand inside your bosom. In other words, tuck your hand in your shirt. And when Moses pulled it out, it was white with leprosy. I've seen leprosy and it's not a pretty sight. God said, put your hand back again. He put his hand back. And when it came out, the flesh was restored. And so God had just demonstrated his power, his ability to bring about miracles in the most strange way. So Moses had to find another tack. He, he tries another excuse. He said, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I don't speak well. I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of tongue. We don't know what problem it was, but obviously he felt that he had either an inability to get across or he had some kind of speech impediment. But this also showed that God's signs hadn't really had an effect, that he was looking for another excuse. And God said to him, who made your mouth? Who controls whether you speak or not? He said, now go, and I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. But it then made it. Moses again hesitated. He says, please send by, by the hand of whomever else you may send. Send somebody else. You know, Moses had tried to free the people, tried to work for, for Israel 40 years ago, and he failed. So send somebody else who will succeed. But this made God angry. He said, Aaron is your brother. He can go. And he can speak for you. You can tell him what to say, and I'll tell you what to tell him what to say. In other words, God was creating a team. God was going to lead. He was going to give Moses the words to be said, and Aaron was going to say them. Sometimes when we have to work at a team because we have a shortcoming, it can be very humbling. We have to acknowledge our weakness. We have to allow someone else to do what we cannot and work with it. But God said, I will teach you what you shall do. And I like this bit because Moses was 80 years of age. And I'm not too far away. And to me, life begins at 80. Moses is going to do on a mission and God is going to lead him. Life is going to begin for Moses. And so God says, you shall be a spokesman to the people. And that rod is going to be the thing which will do the signs, the signs of my power, the signs of my miracle. We can only be effective when we recognise who we are and go from where we are. And that's what God was teaching Moses. You are capable. And where you're weak, I can make up for your weakness. Other people can help you. But you can do the job that I call you to do. God changes us, he makes us people who can work for him. John Newton said, it's by grace, sorry, by God's grace, I am who I am. 
And so Moses goes to, uh, to Egypt and instructions from God are, thus say the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And so I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. This was the message that Moses was to take to Pharaoh. Let my people go. The people were slaves to Pharaoh, but they were sons to God. And this story came, came about because Israel's story began with a cry of oppression, oppressed for freedom. God had a covenant with them. He was concerned about them. And there may be times when God calls us to do something fearful. And we can learn from this story that excuses don't wash with God. He's chosen us because he sees in us the right person for the task. And he will overcome our weaknesses. Moses went and became the great leader, taking Israel to the land that God had promised. Remember, God is holy, God is sovereign, and God is faithful. And no matter how we see ourselves, big or small, God can use us for the task that he wants us to do. And we may not see ourselves as being capable, but God does, and he will give us the capability. We're all his servants. And we all have that message to give freedom to the people. Freedom that comes through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Freedom that comes through the forgiveness of sins. Freedom that comes with the love of our Lord and Saviour. And the Lord gives us all this message. We can all take part in different ways and in different times and in different places. When God calls us, he calls us to serve. And he knows that we can complete the task with his care. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you entrust us in your service. You ask us many times things that you could do yourself, but you entrust these tasks to us. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help us to accept the challenge that you put before us. That in doing so, we put our trust in you. That you will overcome our weaknesses and make us strong. Oh Lord, once Moses stepped over that line, he became a great leader. A great man of history for your people. And Lord, we want to see the people of this world who are enslaved at the moment, freed and come into your kingdom, the land that you have for them. Help us, Lord. Lead us, guide us, and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.
for that message Mike. Um, I will now give a few notices before we close the service. After our pilot service went so well a few weeks ago, um, we're happy to say that we're going to have a prayer service on the third Sunday of the month, which is the 16th of August. Please keep the date free. Ray will send out more information about that soon. As a church, we also meet in smaller groups during the week. Um, some of these have stopped for the summer, so please get in touch with your home group leader to ask what's happening and get in touch with Ray if you'd still like to meet up. And every Sunday we have been having a church coffee morning um, on Zoom before the service where you can meet up with a, a few other people and just keep the community going. Um, please look for your emails for Zoom link information. Um, it will be lovely to see you there to catch up and see you. If you are having trouble getting on, please talk to Ray or talk to me and we can send you the details. And if you'd like anything uh, prayed for, there's a link in the description below to uh, people's emails that you can send over some prayer requests and they'll be praying for you after the service. Thank you very much and see you next week.